Hello, and welcome to this month's edition of Wellness Wednesday, where we share practical wellness tools and techniques from experts on topics that are important to patients, survivors, caretakers alike. I'm Erin Kuhn Krieger, and I'm so happy to be back here moderating tonight's session, where I'll be talking with Chris Rosandich, the Nutrition and Wellness Manager for the Cancer Support Center. Now, before I welcome Chris, I wanna make sure, I wanted to share that we're just a few weeks away from the World Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. Rolf has a number of exciting ways for you to get involved uh, in activities and raising awareness and fundraising efforts. So be sure to follow our social channels to make sure that you can join in on all of the efforts. Now, a few housekeeping items. Don't forget that you can ask questions throughout uh, in the chat box um, below or on uh, Facebook. And we'll be saving all of those questions until the end to make sure that we can get to everybody. Our speaker tonight has a lot of fascinating information to share about the cancer-fighting diet and the impact sugar has on our bodies. Chris has a master's degree in health and nutrition education from Hawthorne University, and she also holds additional certifications, including plant-based nutrition from Cornell University and nutrition and cancer from the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. Welcome, Chris. Hi. Hi, Erin. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Take it away. Good. Thank you. And I just welcome everyone to this presentation. And I am excited to be able to share this valuable information. I've been at the Cancer Support Center for 14 years. And um, it's just, this is a topic near and dear to my heart that I love to talk about and I think is absolutely fascinating, but important. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. We have a lot to cover tonight. So uh, the cancer fighting diet, the truth about cancer. I wanna start off by just uh, giving this disclaimer that all this material provided today is information and educational purposes only. So make sure you reach out to your healthcare professional for the details based on your own health needs, okay? So our objectives today is, is there a connection between sugar inflammation and disease? And you could put the word cancer in with the word disease. So that's a big topic. What is a cancer fighting diet? Foods to focus on and foods to avoid. Um, how much sugar is too much sugar? Types of sugar, are they all the same? Where is sugar hiding and best practices? So. I think you will. You could agree with me that we uh, we have a lot to uncover. So let's just get started uh, talking about the connection between sugar inflammation and disease, and it's real. So for a couple of slides, if you would just bear with me, I'm going to uh, read a few quotes because I want you to hear from the experts. What are they saying about sugar inflammation and disease slash cancer? So unfortunately, sugar is at the top of the foods that may increase muscle and joint inflammation. Numerous studies suggest that processed sugars release pro-inflammatory substances in the body, causing further inflammation in the joints. And, you know, I don't think we always connect the dots that we maybe have too much sugar in our diet and all of a sudden we wake up and our knees, our joints, everything is a little bit sore. But there is that connection, right? A systematic review in, in, from 2018 reported that several studies have linked consuming more dietary sugar, specifically sugary drinks with chronic inflammation. So people with higher sugar diets have more in, inflammatory markers in their blood uh, called C-reactive protein. So it's, I think we all instinctively know that sugar is not good for us, but I I think it's super important to really highlight why and, and what it's doing to our body. I just love this quote from Deep Nutrition. Um, it's a fabulous book if you're looking for a resource, but sugar clogs nutrient channels, weakens bones and muscle and slowing neural communication, which can impair mood. None of us want that memory and which leads to dementia. While all of this is going on, sugar stiffens the collagen in your tendons, joints, and skin, causing arthritis and premature uh, wrinkling, while interfering with the production of new collagen throughout the body. Um, because sugar changes this, those surface markers that we're talking about, 
your white blood cells need to distinguish indigenous cells from invaders. And it opens the door to cancer. That's the connection. One of the connections, I should say. So we talked about sugar briefly. What is inflammation? So we do know that inflammation, it's either acute or chronic. And acute is not an issue because that's a natural healing process. Uh, the white blood cells flood to the scene, like perhaps if you cut your hand, right? Destroying the bacteria, mending the tissues and a, a, attending to the wound. It's that chronic inflammation that for the prolonged periods for several months and years that is gonna uh, cause havoc uh, in your body. The extent and effect of chronic inflammation vary with the cause of the injury and the ability of the body to repair. It's almost like a forest fire that just never goes out. And so research su suggests that this chronic inflammation is associated with many diseases. So we're looking at cancer, we're looking at inflammation, a little bit more from the World Health Organization. They say that this chronic inflammation, uh, these diseases that are caused by the chronic inflammation are the most significant cause of death in the world. And it's just the prevalence, prevalence of diseases associated with chronic inflammation is on the rise for the next 30 years is on the rise. It's just crazy. Nearly 125 million Americans uh, would be living with this chronic condition. And then 61 Americans, million Americans um, live with more than one chronic issue. So it's... I, it's important that we understand the connection, right? And thank you, Erin, for having me on today because we really do know that we have to eat well, but how do we do it? And sometimes if you know the why do you have to eat well, it, it matters, right? It keeps us on um, the journey of, of, of a great diet. So some of the symptoms and side effects, the, the joint pain that we talked about, the insomnia, insomnia that a lot of people have, chronic fatigue, it's probably the number one thing I hear about at the Cancer Support Center is, is this fatigue that everyone is trying to battle. Depression, anxiety, mood disorders, digestive concerns. And, and can I just, before I forget, I just wanna mention that when our digestive system isn't you know, as healthy as it should be, it can lead to, of course, constipation, diarrhea, acid reflux, but it also can lead to sugar cravings. There are a lot of people that think, why do I love sugar so much? Am I literally addicted to sugar? And I'd love for you to look at your digestive health. That would be a place to start. Uh, weight gain, of course, and then frequent in, um, infections. So disease, uh, if you... Gosh, it's just a brief look at disease, but infl inflammation occurs naturally in the body. But when it goes wrong or goes for too long, like we talked about chronic inflammation, it can trigger this process, okay? So I really wanna take a minute and have you ask yourself some questions because I really, I, I really care that you're able to walk away with a strategy or um, some solutions for you and your health that you can customize this presentation for you. And so if you would um, ask yourself these questions, and again, this PowerPoint, I believe will be available online that you can refer back to this slide, but do you feel tired and sluggish most days? Do you feel bloated after you eat? Do you experience indigestion or acid reflux? Do you commonly experience flatulence? Something nobody wants to talk about, right? Um, are your nails and hair thinning? Do you get moody or lightheaded if you haven't eaten? Does your energy level last throughout the day? This is something that you know I focus on. I, I wanna be able to make it from six and seven a.m. to about 10 or 11 p.m., right? Uh, that I have that energy throughout the day? Do you experience foggy thinking? Sometimes have difficulty with word recall. Uh, how do you feel after you eat? This is really important because you start to connect the dots between 
what you're eating and how you feel. Do you crave sweets or salty foods? Do you have allergies or food sensitivities? Do you feel hungry most of the time? Are you satisfied after you eat? And do you often feel guilty with your food choices? Um, do you have difficult, difficulty losing weight? So it, why, do I, why am I asking you to ask these questions to yourself? Because when you're asking these questions and you realize, yes, I've answered yes to some of those, then you can start to zero in on solutions. And some of these questions have to do with sugar consumption. Actually, many of them do. So we have to let food be our medicine, right? That was said um, so many thousands of years ago. And as we move forward, and please forgive me if I'm moving a little quickly, but uh, due to time, I, I want to be able to talk about the strategies, right? I want you to to be able to mindfully think, okay, I answered some questions. I have some issues with flatulence, feeling bloated, uh, with fatigue. What can I do? And that's what I hope that you walk away with, uh, with this presentation. Two of the objectives was um, what is a cancer fighting diet and foods to focus on, foods to avoid? And we can answer that together, okay? And some of you do know the answer which is whole foods. And please just bear with me. I know it's very basic. And you're probably thinking, Chris, people always talk about eating healthy means you have to eat real whole foods, but it is essential for a cancer fighting diet that most of the time we're choosing foods that are as close to its natural state as possible. They spoil faster. They're bright colored, usually have one ingredient, are minimally processed. Uh, you seldom see broccoli being advertised, right? You never see that. And, and it, they contain so many beneficial nutrients that feed your digestive tract. They contain significantly less calories, so you can eat more and feel satisfied. Of course, we know this. They're often found in the perimeter of the grocery store, and they're just amazing for your health, health right? Uh, they help you to lose weight, and they're so supportive. And so what what is a cancer fighting diet? It is these whole foods. It is really a way of, of eating. And I do want to just point out this word to the right, this word uh, diet. I am not really a fan of that word because sometimes you feel um, like somebody is taking foods away from you. You feel a little deprived. So I look at diet as did I eat today? That's the acronym for diet for me. Did I eat today? And therefore, especially if you have a tendency to emotionally eat, um, mindlessly eat, or you're just, you have some bad habits that you need to break. The minute someone tells you you have to be on a diet, I mean, that's not encouraging. And it's more about not what foods you take away from your diet. It's more about the foods that you add into your diet. So every single day, if you wanted a formula, if you have a notebook and a pen uh, with you at this point, it would be three or four servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Really, if you could do five to six um, servings a day, that's a cancer fighting diet all the way up to nine servings. Nuts and seeds. And remember, if you're trying to lose weight, it's just a handful, but nuts and seeds have a lot of minerals in them super important, uh, whole grains. So we wanna stay away from anything white, but we do need servings of whole grains because again, they're loaded with minerals and fiber, uh, vitamins. And so that would be like quinoa, brown rice, right? Uh, instead of the white rice. Spices and herbs, lean meats in moderation, seafood, uh, definitely in moderation, low-fat dairy in moderation. And um, let's see, I'm just going to move this over here. Oh, and naturally sweet foods. My PowerPoint isn't allowing me to see the very bottom. So again, it is an it is a, a, a anti-inflammatory diet. So let's just spend a second talking about this. So inflammation is caused by sugar and processed foods. Inflammation causes all of these side effects, 
including can lead to disease, not always, but leads to disease and, 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 and is a factor in the cancer equation. So if you have cancer and you're looking to prevent cancer from coming back, and or if you are looking to just prevent cancer because you're not uh, diagnosed at this time, it's really important to follow an anti-inflammatory diet. So this is the way of life that we want to uh, eat and follow for forever. So fruits, uh, the low glycemic fruits are more of the berries. So yes, bananas are fine. Really any fruit that's natural is fine in moderation, but it's those light, low glycemic fruits that um, are, are something we want to focus more on. Vegetables, almost all of them are amazing. Nuts and seeds, legumes. If you can add a half a cup of beans in your diet every day, every other day, uh, that would be fa fabulous because beans are loaded with the fiber, again, to heal your digestive tract, to help you feel full. Um, it's just elimination. It's, it, there's so many powerful benefits of eating beans. But if you're sitting there tonight and you're thinking, oh, I have an issue with beans. I have an issue with a lot of, you know, different types of vegetables. Can I just share some um, encouragement for you? Sometimes our digestive tract, if we have not been eating 25 grams of fiber a day or more, if we're eating 10 grams or 12 grams, and again, that might be something you want to track in the future. How much fiber are you eating? Part of a cancer fighting diet. Um, if you're not eating a lot of fiber right now and you add fiber to your diet, you might have some distress in terms of digestive issues. So you might wanna slowly introduce added fiber into your diet, um, drinking lots and lots of water. Healthy fats are super important uh, for not only our brain and our joints, and then of course, making sure that our dairy products are organic, uh, real clean. And then meat, we wanna know what the animal is eating because that's what we're gonna be eating. So if you have it within your budget to get grass-fed beef, lamb, venison, wild game, my son is a hunter. And so uh, he promises me a, a deer venison every year. So I've got a freezer just for it. And, um, you know, just something that is, again, a part of an anti-inflammatory diet. Fish, if you can take in some wild-caught salmon or tuna, mackerel, great sources of protein. Poultry. Uh, why, you know, instead of actually saying cage-free eggs, we actually should say free-range eggs is really what that should say. Uh, if you want, um, you know, the best type of eggs, we we need the that we need the the chickens to be exercising in eating grass and bugs and all the things that they eat uh, to provide the omega-3 fatty acids in that egg. So the condiments, herbs, natural sweeteners, we're going to talk more about it, and then beverages. And actually in an anti-inflammatory diet, if you can, and this is another suggestion, and that's what I try or strive to do, is to give you suggestions throughout the entire presentation, um, then it would be any beverage without any uh, sugar, um, making sure that you minimize the sugar. I'm just gonna grab something here as we move on. And processed foods are the opposite. Those are very inflammatory. So um, they do not spoil, they're dull colored, they are highly refined and they we kind of know what they are, but it's a long ingredient list. Um, they don't contain many nutrients, heavily advertised. So we know a little bit about processed foods, but it is very much a part of an inflammatory diet. So I'm going to provide some suggestions because I'll tell you as Americans, we eat a lot of processed foods. So I would, uh, uh, when we get to the 80-20 suggestion, I'm going to give you um, um, uh, an exercise that you might want to do with you and your family and get the kids involved. Boy, I just love the idea of kids cooking and uh, it, making it a family affair. Okay, so cancer prevention uh, MD Anderson, one of the renowned cancer centers says, you can reduce your risk of cancer significantly by making healthier choices, but they talk about that plant-based healthy diet. Um, 
um, whole grains type of um, eating and being physically active is the best insurance to reduce your risk of cancer as well as heart disease. Um, so how much sugar is too much? And that's a really important question. So we're gonna zero in on sugar the rest of the presentation. So we are eating about 20 to 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. And this would be also an exercise I would love for you to do is to be able to track your sugar. So I'd love for you to track your fiber. I'd love for you to be able to track your sugar um, and just starting to get an idea of how much do you eat on a regular basis. Dr. Axe, a wonderful resource, has a wonderful you know, um, user-friendly website. He says that we're eating about 58% of our daily calories come from processed foods. That's pretty scary. So about 60% of our calories coming from, uh, you know, from processed foods. And if you think about it, if you don't count calories, which most of us don't, if you look at a plate, 60% of that would be processed. That's a, a good visual. So here is the recommendation. Um, we need to know that four grams of sugar is in a teaspoon. Four grams of teaspoon is in, uh, four grams of sugar is in a teaspoon. And the reason we need to know that is the recommendation is for men to eat no more than nine teaspoons a day, women six. Nine for men, women for six. Um, the book, and some of you might've read it, Sugar Crush, any processed package or prepared foods that contain sugar, artificial sweeteners, harmful oils, and additives will all promote inflammation in the body. Uh, the reasoning is that sugar in any form elevates blood glucose levels and triggers the body's inflammatory response. Okay, so again, I think we're really understanding the connection. So let's get to some of the solution. Uh, and, and one of the solutions would be choosing the right type of sugar. Now we all know that sugar is sugar. It really is. Your body looks as sugar as sugar, but these would be the six best options for you, or at least a lot of integrative uh, cancer uh, physicians talk about it because there might be some nutritional value, you know, phytonutrients in raw honey, maple, pure maple syrup, molasses, Okay, uh, and the key is that we have to stay away from the process. And I'd love for you to see that really when we eat sugar, many times our immune system thinks that it's a foreign substance, especially if we have uh, an issue with that substance, especially artificial sugar, and it can cause a reaction, which again is inflammatory. So if you could, just based on time, I can't delve into artificial sugar too much, but some of us are not mindfully thinking about how much sweeter artificial sugar is. So uh, we know that Splenda, um, it's not broken down into the body, right? The same way as regular sugar is, and it's four to 700 times sweeter. Oh my gosh. What about sweet and low, which has been connected, um, to cancer, they've done research on that. That's been out for probably a decade. And so just eliminating the pink packets all together. Um, and then of course, equal, which is those blue packets um, that aspartame is typically found in chewing gum and soda, pudding, sugar-free snacks. Whenever it says sugar-free, most of the time it has artificial sugars. And the reason artificial sugars are so damaging is because they have no calories. So they give the body nothing to burn as fuel. They actually impact the ins insulin system in a very uh, similar way to the, the way that sugar does. And this, if we had more time, I'd love to be able to talk about that, that impact of the insulin system because that's very uh, connected to the, the cancer topic. The sweet flavor hits the tongue and the receptors in the brain light up, right? And the pancreas floods the bloodstream with insulin very much like it does for sugar. I'm looking down at the time because uh, I wanna be respectful of that. 
Artificial sugars keep us chomping at the bit. So we actually need more sugar every single time. And the example would be, you know, if you take artificial sugar in your coffee. So perhaps you take two packets in your coffee every morning, and then you decide artificial sugar is so detrimental to our health. I'm going to go ahead and just use table sugar, right? Um, you would need probably 20 different teaspoons to have it as sweet. So the body gets used to it. Um, and, and we, the body requires, the brain actually requires more sugar uh, if we're um, using that artificial sugar. And then at Purdue University, they conducted two experiments that showed that rats that ate saccharin flavored yogurt gained 29% more weight. I mean, to me, that's just fascinating versus the rats that ate, you know, yogurt that uh, was sweetened with sugar. Sugar has so many names. And so this is important because to eat healthy, we need to read labels. It's, in, it's imperative that we eat, that we read those labels to find out what is actually in the food that we're gonna consume. Now, if it's whole foods, you don't have to worry about it. If it's broccoli or chicken, sweet potatoes, you know, uh, any of the whole foods that we've talked about, you don't need to be concerned about it. But if we're choosing processed foods, oh my gosh, even ketchup has, I think, a teaspoon of sugar per serving. So it is in everything, okay? And these artificial sweeteners, they cause headaches and migraines, weight gain, cardiovascular disease. They increase the BMI. Uh, type 2 diabetes is a concern, intensifies gut inflammation. There's just so many side effects with artificial sugars. So a cancer-fighting diet, if you just want a blanket statement, would be to just get those out of your diet. Just get those out of your diet and then start tracking how much sugar you're eating. No more than six teaspoons a day for women, no more than nine for men. And again, there are days and weeks that maybe we're falling uh, into bad habits, that's fine. We just really need to uh, start to be mindful again and think, okay, I'm gonna get back on that whole foods bandwagon, all right? So, and then just touching briefly on high fructose corn syrup, it costs less. So this is the sugar choice that manufacturers use in most of the processed foods. Um, and we consume a lot of it each year, but look at some of the risk factors. Uh, it upsets the human metabolism, raises the risk of heart disease, diabetes, obesity, forces the liver to pump more heart-threatening triglycerides into the bloodstream. And it zaps your body's reserve of chromium, an important mineral for healthy levels of cholesterol, insulin, and blood sugars. So even just looking at this slide, if you have blood sugar issues, if you have um, cholesterol issues, if you feel tired or run down, the number one thing you could do is get off sugar, okay? And that rapidly absorbed glucose triggers big spikes of insulin, our body's major fat storage hormone. Both of these features of the high fructose corn syrup leads to this metabolic disturbance, okay? All right, so let's, um, this is a slide I'm not gonna talk much about just due to our time, but I want you to know that sugar is super addictive. And I think we know that, but actually in trials, when a rat or mice were addicted to cocaine, when given sugar, they preferred sugar over cocaine. And, and that's alarming, but it's true. It's a very addictive substance. And so, it's not so much that we need to demonize sugar, it's just that we need to control sugar. We need to control it to the point that it's not controlling us, I think is really the bottom line of this lecture um, or discussion. So number one, you eat sugar, you love it. Uh, it has addictive properties like we talked about and the blood sugar level spike, the dopamine is released in the brain and so that that insulin is secreted through the pancreas and it lowers that blood sugar levels. That has to happen. And then, so when those levels fall rapidly, 
uh, it causes immediate fat storage because if we're not like working on the farm or exercising or doing laundry, uh, chasing after our children and we're eating excess sugar, it's gonna be stored as fat, okay? And then of course those body cravings are gonna spike up because the brain says, whoa, need more sugar, need more carbohydrates, need more energy. And then of there's where the hunger and the cravings all start again. So this is a really um, great slide in terms of being visual that this is the cycle we're on. So if I could give you one other recommendation is a lot of us graze throughout the day. I don't know if you're a grazer, but you know we start off by eating breakfast and then maybe 10 o'clock we're having something at noon and two and four and six. And if we're always grabbing a bite of um, you know, kind of a crappy carb, something sugary, um, chips. If we're not eating whole foods, what happens is this spike continues all day long. And that's what's so harmful for our system. So you might decide, you know what, I'm going to go to three meals a day with two snacks and start to eliminate the graze, grazing that I'm doing. So one of the ob other objectives that we wanted to cover was where is it hiding? Well, we kind of know that it's hiding in the processed foods. 77% of American grocery purchases consist of either moderately or highly processed foods. So when you are grocery shopping, if you can look at your card, it should look like really, I mean, once you get through produce and the meat department, we really have no business being in the grocery store unless you want to get canned tomatoes or beans, um, you know, or then you make your way back, you know, to the, to where you're getting your eggs and dairy uh, and cheese. And so we talked a little bit about looking at the ingredient list. This is super important. And why I listed this in the PowerPoint is because Yes, the whole, the first ingredient is whole. So you always want that first ingredient to be whole or cracked if you're looking at a complex carb. But look at, they have like six or seven different types of sugar. And why is that? Do you think it really enhances the flavor of this processed food? No, the manufacturer knows that you're very savvy and that you don't want sugar to be the first ingredient, right? Um, because it's always the first five or seven ingredients. Well, all of these ingredients are based on weight. So if they break it down into different types of sugar, it won't be listed number one. So it's sometimes you only look at the five ingredients. I do the same thing and you're thinking, okay, not so bad. Sugar is listed, uh, you know, number, number four. But boy, if you added up all the sugar, it would surely be number one, okay? And so as we move forward, you can just see that there's a lot of sugar, 10 grams of sugar. Um, you know, the cubes represent a teaspoon. So this is 10, not grams, but teaspoons of sugar. So you have a can of soda that is 10 teaspoons of sugar. And I think we know that, but boy, we have to live our life based on that information that we've already exceeded our limit for the day. Um, and looking at juice. And yeah, juice might have a little bit of vitamin C and some vitamins in there, but all in all, it's loaded with sugar. Look at all these little cubes. These are all teaspoons of sugar. Remember we said one teaspoon of sugar equals four grams of sugar. And the reason we need to do that, I'm just gonna go back. It's not listed here, but on the ingredient list, it will say sugar, how many grams? And that's why you need to know the grams. And so when you're reading something, we're going to go through some, some other additional products so we can do that. 49 grams of sugar. And yes, I'm a fan of Starbucks and it's okay to have one or two of these wonderful lattes during the holiday season, but just know that there is a lot of sugar in that. Um, and you know, my gosh, this slide just represents that sometimes, yes, the yogurt has more nutritional value than the Twinkie, but still a lot of sugar. And what you have to ask yourself, is it added sugar or is it natural sugar? If it's natural sugar from fruit, there's no problem. We're not talking about fruit here. We're talking about added sugar. Um, and, and so we have to be mindful. And some of these healthy bars, uh, just too much sugar. Now, one of my favorite foods used to be this uh, Panera pumpkin muffin. Again, I'm not demonizing this pumpkin muffin because it's amazing, 
I'm a fan of Panera, but 52 grams of sugar. And I actually did a cheat sheet just so that I could uh, look down and say that there's 13 teaspoons of sugar. So now when I go to Panera, I share my, my muffin with someone, right? I'm not going down by myself. So uh, this Panera of a plain bagel, five grams, uh, not so bad, but you know, with just a couple of uh, chocolate cookies, 30 grams. And then I, I didn't have time to list too many options of food choices, but I wanted to show you a few things. Even in onion rings, 51 grams of sugar, which is again, if, if you're a big eater and you ate this entire uh, uh, you know, amount of, of onion rings, you would be taking in about 13 grams of sugar. Um, if you're looking at, you know, P.F. Chang's, um, let me see if I can move this. Yeah, 77 grams of sugar is crazy. That, that's 19 grams of sugar. Now you would eat that whole portion and it's probably in the sauce, but still uh, that, that is a lot of sugar. If you're looking at this amazing salad, a lot of us think we're doing good by eating a salad, but probably most of the sugar is in the salad dressing. So you might wanna do a different strategy of balsamic vinegar or something. You know, I always think about, you know, saving your sugar for something really super worth it, right? And then again, um, the spicy chicken. Look at 90 grams of sugar. Who would think that, that much sugar? So let's just talk about uh, best practices here. Reduce uh, or eliminate sugar altogether. So some people can just do an all or nothing. Uh, and and if, if you've never given up sugar for a week or two, I recommend that. It's, it's wonderful because you will feel less bloated. You're, you're, you just have more energy. Um, it's important to know your numbers. So if you haven't been to the doctors and you don't know um, what you know, some of those numbers are, that's important. Just getting processed foods out of your diet is, is, a, is, is a strategy that you can use for you and your family. Uh, cut back on eating out fast food and restaurants because we know there's a lot of sodium and fat, uh, crappy fat and sugar in a lot of that. An elimination diet is somebody that's more addicted to sugar, um, but an option of following the anti-inflammatory diet that we talked about and then just cut out all sugar in your beverages. And then I wanted to talk about 80-20. And it's, this is to me a wonderful strategy because what it is, is it's 80% of the time you're eating whole real foods. And so many clients that I work with at the Cancer Support Center, they, uh, if you were to list out every item that you ate for a day, and remember I talked about, I wanted to give you uh, a little bit of homework to do for a couple of days, list out every single thing. So if you had eggs and toast and peanut butter, um, maybe yogurt with blueberries in them, list out every ingredient and next to it, write down if it's processed or if it's whole. Is it processed foods or whole? And so most people eat about, I'd say about 15, 16 items a day. And so an 80, 20 look at that would be you're, you're allowed to have two or three snacks a day, serving sizes, right? Of processed foods. So that's not like eight treats a day. That's like two treats a day. And so you really have to look at what, what is that? So you're having oatmeal for breakfast. You're having you know, a salad for lunch and salmon and broccoli for dinner. And then you still have a small bowl of ice cream and maybe um, is a, some potato chips or something. But it's, it's really that 80-20 concept. So you feel like every day you get a little treat. You don't feel deprived, okay? And then really looking at your systems. Systems are important because if you, they say that it's not you that's not achieving your goal, it's that maybe your system is, is not setting you, yourself up for success. So a system would be just get the sugar and processed foods out of your house, right? Or at least put them in a cabinet all by themselves. So you actually have to mindfully walk over to that cabinet. Okay, so I'm gonna list these out fairly quickly, but it's balancing your blood sugar because whenever there swings in that blood sugar, that drives cravings. Eating protein and healthy fats and carbohydrates and um, just, really start your day off with a, a, a 
protein filled breakfast. I have so many people that say I don't eat breakfast um, and they're getting in most of their calories at the end of the day when a lot of times our willpower is a little bit off and we start making poor choices. And so really this is one of the plates I like to show. It's a superfood plate by a chiropractor in Florida. And it's, this is what our plate should look like, really protein, fats, carbs, and veggies with clean water, okay? And remember just one or two or three treats a day. And then I wanted to include suggestions for sugar cravings. And so if you, sh if you truly crave sugar, how do you combat that? And so I'm giving you some suggestions. Uh, first, you have to determine how much sugar you're eating. So you actually have to maybe count uh, the teaspoons of sugar per day. Uh, consider a, a sugar detox, and that might be for two days. That might be for two weeks or, or a month. It, it's, it's not easy to do. It's difficult, but it's, it's important. Uh, address some of your stressors uh, that may be causing your dependency replace it with a habit, maybe take a walk, uh, actually do the laundry, right? That always feels good to get a chore done uh, or do some homework with, with, with your little one. Uh, consider complete avoidance, avoidance, just get the sugar out of your house, right? Inform yourself, really, and I have some resources for you. Sometimes just learning more about um, something you're struggling with will really empower you to make changes. Um, at the Cancer Support Center, boy, we, we really strive to teach people to be gentle with themselves. And if you have a day that you're eating a lot of sugar, you're stressed out, don't worry. You know, tomorrow is a new day. Uh, replace uh, dessert with something healthy, right? Um, one of my favorite desserts is almond milk with some blueberries. And even if I do a drizzle of maple syrup, I just feel like I'm getting that touch of sugar. Of course, you're... Uh, need to almost see if there's any deficiencies in your body. Are you eating enough protein and healthy fats and fiber and are you getting enough sleep? So as I conclude our conversation today, really it's one-sided conversation. I, I apologize about that because we're all online, but um, these are amazing resources and these are just some of my favorites, um, but it depends on what your concerns are. And remember I was asking you all those questions earlier on by answering those questions, you might start to uh, recognize that it's specific in a certain area. So if you are a cancer patient, uh, this book is one of my favorite resources, The Cancer Fighting Kitchen by Rebecca Katz. Um, amazing recipes in there and teaches you how to get through chemo. Whole 30 if you wanna get off sugar. Uh, if you're more spiritual, the, the Daniel plan is wonderful. If you've got autoimmune solicitors, uh, autoimmune issues. Um, Amy Meyer's book's wonderful. If you're, if you're ha struggling to change bad habits, Atomic Habits by James Clear is my favorite. Uh, I think a lot of young people need to read this book because it's fabulous. And then Bright Line Eating, um, it's all about addiction. And boy, she teaches people to get off of sugar as an addiction. Uh, you should read her story. Fabulous. Uh, one of my favorite resources is... Um, Joshua Axe, and then 80% of our immune system resides in our gut. So to become experts in gut health, uh, this is a fabulous, fabulous book to read. And remember for all cancer patients, when you're taking on treatment or on a, a lot of medications, we really need to look at digestive health. And then here's a few additional resources for you as cancer patients um, that you might wanna look at. So again, I just really want to say thank you. Thank you to Erin. And um, let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Oh, we did. Okay. Just thank you. Thank you so much for having me, allowing me to talk on and on, but I think it's an important topic. It, it <clears throat> excuse me. It absolutely is, Chris. It's, it's so fascinating. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the notion of what, how you can help your body by what you're putting in it. Um, so I have a lot of questions, as I mentioned, um, in our, in our pre-show, um, and we've received a lot from our viewers as well. So let's jump on in. So I noticed, um, in the, one of the slides of the books, you had a, a keto, um, book. So what's your take on the, what I'll call fad diets of keto and paleo? Um, and, and we had a question about intermittent, intermittent fasting. What are your thoughts on those? 
it's a great question. And um, I'm in favor of both the keto diet as well as intermittent fasting for different reasons. Just be mindful that the keto diet, A, is very difficult to do. Um, so go in it with that expectation that's a little bit more challenging because it's many times, it's a very low carb diet. Uh, can be, you know, 20 carbs or less, but very healthy for the body. But there are doctors that um, recommend that you might, unless you have a cancer diagnosis, you might not want to be on that low carb diet forever. There's a reason you're on it, maybe to lose weight, um, but then you might want to get off it and encourage, start to include some uh, whole grains. Intermittent fasting is fabulous because at, that could be that you stop eating at 7 or 8 p.m., and allow your body to heal all night long and then have some water in the morning and break that fast with breakfast. So it's very healing. So yes, love it. Great. Uh, what is, what, how about a day of meals for you? What does that look like? You know, a day of meals for me, I like to start off with eating as healthy as possible because I feel like my willpower is a little bit um, supporting me in making those decisions. So I'll either eat oatmeal or eggs. I'll have yogurt, maybe a healthy smoothie with lots of vegetables and fruit, um, you know, whole grain toast. Uh, and then lunch is usually leftovers for me. Dinner then would be maybe salmon or salads. And as we talked about 80, 20, um, I save my treats. I love to eat. I do. I eat a lot of food. And I love to have treats, but I want to make sure I sit down with my green tea and I've got my, my cookies. I'm not perfect. You know, I, I eat like the rest of us do um, sometimes, but then I just try to jump back in eating healthy. I, I love that notion of, you know, it's, it's okay if you're having a rough day, then you just start back up tomorrow. So yeah. our audience is comprised of um, those fighting pancreatic cancer to those caring for their loved ones, to those Inter simply interested in staying healthy. What's your adv advice for um, everyone who wants to eat healthier, but is short on time or resources? Yeah, that is a great question. And boy, I get that question a lot. So you do have to look at your lifestyle and does this fit in with that? So as important it is, it, it is to eat whole foods. Number one, I would reach out to caregivers. A lot of caregivers ask, what can I do? And so maybe they do your grocery shopping and they make sure that your vegetable bin has fruits and vegetables in there, correct? Um, maybe they make you one soup a week because soups are such a great option uh, for eating healthy. And you can include bone broth in with your soup. Um, that is very healing with loaded with the minerals. You can also go to places, instead of going to fast food restaurants, you can go to a grocery store, like a Italian deli, and they sometimes can do the cooking for you. You can pick up meatloaf or stuffed peppers or, you know, raviolis. And so it might not be 100% whole, but it's better than some of the fast food options, right? And then I like to talk about if you are cooking, just cook a couple of times a week, but overcook. So if you're cooking turkey meat, maybe cook turkey burgers and a meatloaf at the same time. Because remember, for a lot of us, if we cook the meal, it can last five to seven days in the refrigerator. You know, don't quote me on that, but that's, you know, uh, a recommendation or a guideline, I should say. So that might help a little bit. But again, remember when we talked about being gentle with yourself. Um, and, and one last thing is just, you know, if you're really hungry, you're tired, you're exhausted, I know it's not fun to grab an apple, but grab an apple with some peanut butter. You know, just look outside that box and think, you know what? After the first or two, the first or second bite, you're going to forget that you really wanted potato chips most of the time. <laughs> That's a good caveat. Uh, let's talk sugar, sugar cravings. Um, what are some things to eat to calm those cravings? And then, you know, I'm sure we've all experienced the, the sugar withdrawal headaches. Um, what do you recommend to kind of gently ease us through that situation? Well, some of us can't ease through it. They almost need to go cold turkey and you start, you either go cold turkey with no sugar, or then you really start to, um, look at six teaspoons a day, um, even 10 teaspoons a day or less, because boy, that, that doesn't go far, really. It doesn't go far at all. So that might be something that you want to start with. 
just by eating less sugar will help you reduce the sugar cravings. So that's important to know. But also it could be a deficiency. You could be deficient in chromium. You could be deficient in magnesium. There are some deficiencies that are causing you to, to crave sugar. The other thing is digestive health. When you have too many bad bacteria overtaking the good bacteria, bad bacteria love sugar. So if somebody says to me, I crave sugar, the first place we start is digestive health. How about, um, now going back on, on the teaspoon idea, is, is it added sugar or is it just sugar in general? What's been so helpful is in, in our Nutrition Facts labels in the last year, they've broken those two down. So when you look, see before when you looked at added sugar or actually total sugars, you didn't know if they were added or if they were natural from fruit. And now they're broken down. So you can see total sugar, and then let's say there's 10 total sugar, but then there's six added. It's the added that we wanna stay away from. Okay. So 10 minus six would be four, and you know that there's probably some fruit in that uh, product. How about your take on eating organic? I noticed um, that within the plate, the breakdown, it had organic protein, I think, on there. Um, are, you a, are you a proponent of organic all around? Are there specific things? Obviously, organic, um, it's, it costs more money. Um, and you know, that's, that's the, the, one of the challenges that we face is that the less healthy foods are less expensive and the healthy is, is more. So what, what do you recommend uh, going organic on? Um, again, a question I get asked often. So why do we even want to go organically? The reason is, is because we want to eat products in, that have less negative ingredients, toxic ingredients in them. So if you have cancer and you're battling cancer, you don't need added extra toxicity in your body, right? Your liver is already trying to process enough. And so we wanna minimize the toxicity uh, in our daily diet. Saying that, then you're starting to look at everything and starting to list it out. And I would love for people to go on Environmental Working Group's website. EWG. And what they do is they list out, uh, you might have heard of um, the Dirty Dozen. And the Dirty Dozen, what they figured out is those are the, the, the top 12 fruits and vegetables that have the highest pesticide load. And so for, for, I really follow that because I'll tell you food is expensive and I think it's getting a little bit more expensive. It's a concern. So you don't have to buy everything organically. What I would recommend is following the dirty dozen, and or if you can buy uh, maybe a higher grade meat, any kind of meat product, dairy product, um, being concerned with that when you can do it. And if not, just wash your fruits and vegetables really good. And how about the, the non-GMO um, aspect of things? Does that factor into the, the sugar intake and, or is that more the pesticides and the um, what's put into the foods? GMOs, I mean, we're gonna hear more and more about GMOs. Uh, those are genetically modified organisms in our food. You know, back 50 years ago, it wasn't even a, a conversation, right? A, a topic for conversation. But now we have just so many genetically modified foods. And what happens is for some of us, we have an irritation to those genetically substances in those genetically modified foods, like for example, peanuts. Uh, so it's, it's a concern uh, really for all of us. And if we can do GMO, if it's not that costly to do GMO, it would be beneficial. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there such thing as a bad fruit or vegetable? <laughs> no, I don't really think so. Because again, your goal is to eat whole fresh foods. Now, saying that, if you have a health issue like prediabetes or diabetes, then you want to be concerned with some of the higher glycemic fruits, right, uh, and vegetables. So you want to be mindful of potatoes and bananas. And so you don't want to eat an abundance of them, but you surely can eat them, you know, and, and know that they're whole, uh, whole foods that have vitamins and, and minerals in there. You want to stay with some of the lower glycemic fruits and vegetables like greens, berries, things like that. 
how about let's talk cheating. <laughs> um, you know what? What are some foods that those of us who um, you know do have that taste for something sweet? Um, what's something that you talked about the the apple and peanut butter, or so, you know what are what are some kind of <clears throat> excuse me tricks of the trade that kind of trick your mind into thinking? <laughs> That mm -hmm. you're you're having something um, <laughs> that you shouldn't be, but is is still healthy. Uh, yeah, fabulous question. Um, so there's a couple of things I'd like to say about that. If we just have a minute, number one is James Clear did a lot of research on anticipation, and they've studied like, for example, gamblers. They get more excited about thinking about gambling than actually gambling. So sometimes just by thinking about the food. Um, you know, the sugary food, you know, I'm not going to say it's going to replace it, but sometimes we just jump in with two feet too quick. So allow yourself a little bit of time. And sometimes you change your mind. Number one, number two, I think it's a, what I love about 80, 20 is it allows you to have some treats. So you don't feel deprived. I mean, who can live a life without treats? So it allows you to be able to have a few things that you love. Um, for example, if you know you're going away for the weekend or going to a party or it's a holiday, just make sure you eat really well during the day so that you're filled up with fiber and protein and healthy fats and so you can have a treat or two. Uh, make sure that you actually eat because could you only imagine that if you're, wait, if you're starving and then and you're going to overeat? And that brings us to portion control. That's the biggest uh, trick to managing processed crappy foods is portion control. Actually put a serving of potato chips in a bowl and then go walk uh, to the family room and watch television. Sometimes, you know, we just don't want to go with the bad. So it's really about portion control, but it's not about deprivation. Life is hard enough. And I, I think it's okay to enjoy and indulge, but we have to do it mindfully. Sure. Sure. Um, okay. Well, on when Wellness Wednesdays, we'd like to talk about practical advice and takeaways, and you've had a number that you have shared throughout. Um, to kind of summarize and wrap things up, what are the top three takeaways that you would uh, want view our viewers tonight to, to walk away with? Um, that's a great question. I would say number one, 80-20. In, unless you really have that type of an addiction um, to sugar, I think sometimes following an 80-20 to know that every day you get a couple of treats and starting to really learn what foods are you choosing. That's number one. Um, number two, I would say, just be gentle with yourself. I think sometimes we associate some of the negative emotions with food. Like the minute we have a piece of cake, we, we demonize ourselves and, and there's a lot of guilt and shame. So we have to be gentle with ourselves. Um, that would be number two. And number three, um, gosh, I would just have to say, uh, making sure that you're eating a little protein and healthy fat at every meal, because I hear from too many people that they're not doing that and they're just starving and then you're making poor choices. Sure. I really, I really appreciate that. And, and I love the notion that you, you don't like the word diet that, um, and, and if I remember correctly, when we initially were speaking, you, you talked about the, the root of the word diet or the, um, did you the acronym that? Um, and, and it's not supposed to be deprivation. It's what you should be adding in. Um, and so I, I love that notion of, um, let's focus on the positive of it and not what you, what you can't have. It's, I think that that is the foundation of a cancer fighting diet. Don't focus on what you can't have, focus on what we should be having or can have. Right. And when you fill your diet with fruits and vegetables and healthy foods and beans and nuts and seeds. You almost don't have time for treats. You know, you're you're like, oh my god, I can't even fit those in. So, yep, you're right. Well, that's fantastic, and and I know that I have a lot of um, work to do and a lot of key takeaways um, that I will be taking with me when I go grocery shopping next. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. We really appreciate your time, your knowledge, and everything that you're that you're doing. Um, this is such useful and important information for all facets of our community. So, thank you again. Thank you, Erin. Thank you for having me. Of course, and thanks to everyone uh, who is joining us tonight. If you're watching the replay, please go ahead and write replay in the comments. And um, that way you could ask your questions and we'll make sure that we get them to Chris and we could get them back to you. 
and mark your calendars for next month's Wellness Wednesday, which is on November 10th, where we'll be partnering with the Cancer Wellness Center and talking about advancements in treating pancreatic cancer. A lot of fascinating information has just recently come out and we'll be um, putting, oh, actually it's in the chat now. So you can go ahead and register for that now. And if you have ideas for future Wellness Wednesday editions, please send them to us. We're always looking for content to make sure that we are addressing your needs. And you can do that by sending us an email at info at ralphfoundation.org. Once again, stay tuned to Ralph's social channels in the coming weeks as we announce details for World Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month. So many great activities, information, fundraising ideas that we'll be sharing soon, and we would love for you to participate. On behalf of everyone at the Ralph Pancreatic Cancer Foundation, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you have a great evening. Continue to do your part in being safe, and we look forward to seeing you back here next month. Take good care.